They, they trapped all of us in there. That was the worst of all, all of the fighting was there. That was the worst. The Second World War was a massive event, and hardly a soul living at the time would go unaffected by it. This is the story of Harry Shaw Jr., nicknamed Pete by those who know him best. Like millions of other Americans, Pete's motivation for volunteering his service would be the very thing that finally engaged the United States into the war, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But for Pete, the sting of destruction and defeat would hit it a little closer to home. My, uh, one of my best friends, well, Carlo Corella, was, which was a great friend of mine. His brother was in the Navy, and he, he was at Pearl Harbor. He'd never come back. I enlisted when I was 17 because they, they couldn't get him fast enough. As the United States delved deeper and deeper into war, more and more servicemen were needed. Not only had Pete long been ready to serve, but he knew exactly where he wanted to be. So we decided, Carlos says, Pete, we went all through high school together, grade school together. He was my bestest friend. And he says, we're going in the Navy. But Pete knew his hopes of joining the Navy could be crushed by one unfortunate fact. He was colorblind. And the physical inspection he would need to pass depended on his ability to see a series of faded numbers hidden within various colors. But as the boys stood in line for their inspection, Pete's friend Carlo came up with a plan. He went first. He says, now when I shot them numbers out, you listen. <clears throat> so he went up there and he went like 99. 44, 70, what's this? So anyhow, they said, next, now and then, he says, now here's a folder here, and I'm gonna turn this folder over, page by page, and you'll see all them dots, different colors, and there'll be a number up here. So you tell me what number you see. Now I know what he said, and I did. I went like 99, 34, he went to pick the next one, and I said, well, whatever it was, 47. But it slipped, and it didn't turn over. He said, how would you know it's that? <laughs> I says, I'm in the Army. <laughs> they took a tray out and dumped it out on the desk. He says, pick out the red. I says, I'm in the Army. <laughs> we took our basic training in what they call Tar Paper City in Dothan, Alabama. They didn't have barracks or nothing. They had four by fours in the ground with tar paper wrapped around them and cots on the sand. That was our bunks. As the need for fresh combat recruits increased, Pete was sent to the United Kingdom to finish his training, now part of the 283rd Field Artillery Battalion. Only months later, he would have his initial introduction into combat by means of the largest seaborne invasion in history the event that would turn the tide of the war in Europe, D-Day. On June 6, 1944, Pete would make his landing on Utah Beach at Normandy. As the American infantry cleared the beach of German opposition, Pete brought the heavy artillery onto the shore. They cleared the shore. We, we, we went on the LSTs that had was like a barge with the front went down then we pulled right out and pulled the trailers with us. We took all that stuff with us. As part of a convoy carrying supplies and heavy weapons, Pete traveled primarily at night under the cover of darkness while the German Luftwaffe patrolled the skies above. And there were no lights. You couldn't use a light. They had what they call cat eyes. They have a little light that, that big, one inch by half an inch light. That's what, that's what you went by. Well, where that Jeep or command car went, we followed them, but all we followed was them two little cat eyes. But that's how they traveled, so that we didn't get shelled at night, because they were up there. We had pretty good success, but we had a couple of experiences that weren't too good. But that's kind of hard. <laughs> 
Next, Pete and the 283rd moved on to St. Lo. The French city had been under German occupation for four years and was now a strategic objective in the battle for Normandy. But the enemy opposition there was stronger and more relentless than what Pete had seen on Utah Beach. That was something like a 22-day battle. It was terrible. It just, we lost a lot, a lot. I lost our, our general. He couldn't wear a, a helmet, a seal. He wore a lighter. But if they ever caught us without our seal helmet on, they would court martial you. They say, that's your life. Well, they found half of his head off. It's devastating. But it, it was rough all over for everybody. And, uh, and then when uh, about the, the fifth day, sixth day, Seventh day, eighth, tenth, up to the, we had them on, on the run, and uh, we really didn't have time to, to think about anything. The British and American forces continued from town to town in an effort to drive the Germans back towards Berlin. Some towns were taken, lost, and taken again, and wherever there was fighting, there was destruction. A lot of destruction. Like I say, St. Lowe, Colmar, Cologne, some beautiful, in Germany especially, some beautiful, beautiful buildings. In Nuremberg and Frankfurt, them city was just, we just annihilated them. Well, we had to to get the Germans out. Progress continued until December. Only a few days before Christmas, 1944, Adolf Hitler launched a surprise attack, throwing every available man and machine at the advancing Allied forces. The surprise had worked. The American lines were broken, creating a rift 70 miles wide and 50 miles deep. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. That was their last big push, and it was big. We were numbfounded, you know. It was just that, that quick. And, and how that we never even had an idea about it. And, and where they got all of them, we didn't know. How many, the soldiers that they poured in there, they, they trapped all of us in there. That was the worst of all, all of the fighting was there. That was the worst. Some of my friends weren't as lucky as me. And five feet from you, five feet from you. And you say, how, how could they, and, and not me, you know. They decided that we wouldn't give up. And for the support that we had to come up immediately, especially the, I think it was the 42nd Division. Boy, they, they really, one of the divisions that really got us out of there. But that was the end of it. After that, why, it was all over. There was no more. After 40 days, the Battle of the Bulge was finally over. For the Allies, the end of the war seemed closer than ever. There was a notable change in their German enemies. While some were still dedicated to fight on, most seemed to have resolved within themselves that their Fuhrer was a madman. And for them, the war was all but lost. They wanted to be so peaceful, the Germans, you know, because they know that was it. And they realized it was over. And everybody was evacuating Berlin to go to London there and to fly over, you know, bail out. The surrendering Germans would much rather be captured by their British and American opponents to the west rather than their Soviet foes to the east. The conflict between Germany and the Soviet Union had been much more personal and severe. They knew they would receive no mercy from the Red Army for the atrocities the Nazi regime had carried out. Pete saw the effects of these atrocities firsthand when he took part in the liberation of Dachau, the original concentration camp, where prisoners were tortured, starved, and murdered. 
Many of those who survived to see their liberation were sick and dying. When the 283rd arrived, smoke still billowed from the crematoriums. More than 70 years later, these images, still vivid in Pete's memory, were too difficult for him to talk about on camera. But he and the 283rd had done their part, and soon it would be time to come home. We went to the channel then in uh, January of 46 and to get on the boat to come home. We pulled in there and the docks were nothing but people. I said, there, there's no room to walk. They were all waving flags, you know. It was cold, but hell, half of them were, were, didn't even have a cover on. For Pete, the welcome to his home country had been warm and well-deserved. But his own family had no idea he'd even made it back to the States until they received a phone call in the middle of the night. It was... Uh, 1.45 in the morning, my dad answered the phone and I said, Dad, I'm at the bus station. He said, who is this? I said, it was Pete, your son. You're where? And I said, I'm at the bus station. Oh, he said, well, uh, your brother's working uh, midnights and he doesn't get off till 7.30, you know, in, in the morning. So. Uh, I don't know who I can get. I says, that's all right, I'll take a cab. Here, in the meantime, my dad called Timpkin, where my brother worked, and, and told me you get in touch with Hobart Shaw that his brother's down at the depot, the bus depot. Go get him. When I go uh, get in the door, why, my brother was just going by the car, and he wasn't going to turn around. He said, I'll bet you that's Pete. And I was, you know, got there at 2 o'clock in the morning on February the 9th. So it was a long spell. To this day, Pete is a highly celebrated veteran of the Second World War. In November of 2016, he was awarded with the French Legion of Honor, a prestigious award given by the government of France to those who serve in combat on French soil. Over seven decades later, Pete's service in the war still has a profound effect on his life. You gotta be friendly to people and, and try to, uh, to understand them. I know a lot of them people over there, even the English. You know, they, we're so sorry to see you over here. You know, that you have to leave your home to come over here. And the same with friends. And, and uh, Poland especially, you know, that they thought so much of us for doing what we're doing. I said, well, well, we have to. So you see, that dwells on you, that they were so concerned about something like that. So it kind of made me feel, you know, you got to understand, like people. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just wanna say a big thank you so much for watching our first episode. We were so excited to finally bring this content to you, along with many other episodes that are to come. We're really excited for you to see it. Now currently we're releasing one episode on the first Friday of every month. We'd love to bring you more content more frequently, but we need your help in order to do that. If you'd like to contribute to what we're doing, you can click on the link below for our Patreon page. If you wanna hear more amazing stories like these, please consider subscribing to this channel and click the notification bell so you can stay up to date when we release new stories. And one final way that you can support us is to share. Share these videos, share these stories, help us to honor these veterans and educate younger generations. We wanna thank you again for your support and thank you for watching.